We're going to hold this roundtable in English this evening. We have uh, artists from across Europe in the exhibition. Of course, as we're going to do a discussion, it could be that someone may want to answer in German, which is completely fine. And if we have time at the end, questions, of course, are, are also welcome in German. We have less than an hour. And uh, our, my intention is that I would discuss a little bit about the premise of this exhibition with you and uh, to t talk about the topic of phenomenology a little bit. It's a big topic. Um, and then I have two questions that I'm going to pose to each of the artists one by one. And almost everyone knows these questions. <laughs> but um, I think that given discussions we've had over the last day or so, um, and uh, the press conference this morning, and the text that I've written that um, mostly everyone has seen so far who's been here, um, we've had some discussion already about this topic. And so to give you an introduction, A Painter's Doubt uh, comes, it's, it's inspired by a text called Cezanne's Doubt which was written in 1945 by Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And this is something that I read uh, as an art student many years ago. And last year I was reading uh, a wonderful book called The Existentialist Cafe by Sarah Bakewell. And just a note, she's speaking in Munich next week at the uh, München Literature House. So if anybody is going to Munich next weekend, I highly recommend it because she is absolutely a fantastic writer and speaker. She's written um, about Montaigne, this philosopher uh, from many, many centuries ago. And this book, The Existentialist Cafe, is between biography and philosophy, discussing mostly existentialism and phenomenology. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm purely an amateur, so I would not be able to give you a succinct uh, nor accurate um, summary of what phenomenology is. But what I might do is read a few passages from the text that I wrote and a couple of passages from Merleau-Ponty. But the, the curatorial premise of the exhibition was to take this text by uh, Merleau-Ponty and some of the ideas he discusses about phenomenology according, uh, he's placing them in the context of Cezanne, Paul Cezanne's painting. And so there are some ideas sketched with this text that I wanted to see if they had a relevance today, uh, you know, 60, more than 60 years later, in a completely different time, when we have a completely different relationship with questions of philosophy, we have a completely different relationship with representation, we have a completely different relationship with how we receive ideas and information today. And Actually, part of the impetus of this exhibition is that, uh, to simply put it, I, I wanted to, to actually create a sensuous exhibition um, because this is actually something quite implicit and important in phenomenology, that it's, uh, it's nearly a engagement with the sensuousness of reality, that this is what we should base our perception upon. In that, there's no separation between ourselves as individuals and the space and time that we're immersed in. Whereas in traditional philosophy, there's often a separation between the object and the observer, like in Cartesian thinking. This is something separated from the observer so that it can be put into an idealized space. Phenomenology instead argues that this, there should be no separation between myself and the object that in order to understand the object, the moment of perception, the moment of engaging with this object is relevant, is in fact part and parcel of what that object is. So for example, now, if we put into the context of today, um, those of you who might be looking at quantum physics, even in, in uh, popular magazines, will see that light particles, when observed going through uh, uh, a enclosed system will behave differently than when they're not observed. This is completely incredible to think about. And I think that this is actually also in a way related to this topic um, that's 
is the impetus behind this exhibition. But why painting? Um, for me, I thought, of course, in addition to the fact that it's coming out of this text that uh, Merleau Ponty wrote about Suzanne, that painting today is, well, maybe, you know, a slightly overlooked medium or misunderstood medium or something that, um, you know, carries associations and brings its own burden when people come to experience it, when people come to look at it. Now, um, you know, especially here in the Kunstverein, I have to say, you know, this is the first painting exhibition that I've organized here. Um, you know, we've had exhibitions with painting, um, but many of the exhibitions have been more uh, around new media, more engaged with politics, for example, thematic uh, sketches on representation, uh, and so on. And this exhibition, as I said, I really wanted to be something more sensuous, and I hope that, um, I hope that everyone is pleased with uh, the result of it. But maybe before I start posing questions, just to ground what I just mentioned in a little bit of the reference, I'll read a couple passages. So, consciousness, says Merleau-Ponty, is like a fold in the universe. So, Bewusstsein is wie ein Falter im Universum. Yeah, this idea. So he distinguishes phenomenology from a tradition of Cartesian thought, as I mentioned. A Cartesian can believe that the existing world is not visible, that the only light is of the mind, and that all vision takes place in God. He opposes, this is Merleau-Ponty, the Cartesian view of representations of the world within the mind as intellectual accounts of objects. Uh, instead, Merleau-Ponty believes that we must cope with things as they are. Cope is, I think, quite an important word because it's not just a question of looking at something or perceiving something, it's actually engaging in a multifaceted relationship to it. He sees them, he says that we must see them as they are rather than being separated from us. He speaks of a primordial openness to the world a pre-linguistic, pre-conceptual relationship without propositional content. And propositional content would be, for example, when we are we come to understand something through our history of being told what it is. So when I meet someone, again, the history of my relationship to them or all of the assumptions that I had about this person or what I've been told all come to, to help me form my judgment of that person, to simplify. He says we should do without those things. You need to have a pure relationship to what you're experiencing. <clears throat> and this is why Suzanne's uh, painting was so important for Merleau-Ponty, for the artist captured the atmosphere of what surrounded him. So when Suzanne was painting, he's not merely representing a mountain, He's actually trying to reconstruct the space, the time, the moment, the sensuousness, the palpable feeling of that space, time, and the fact that he's painting it is like a, a mediation between himself and the mountain and the space. That it's all this activity captured in the picture. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, so he doesn't see himself separate for, from uh, the sensual reality that he's painting. Um, yeah. Just a bit here, I was going to read out about the biography of uh, Cezanne. But as I mentioned in the press conference this morning, um, you know, I've also felt in organizing the show, and I felt I feel often when making exhibitions that you know any exhibition could actually be called a curator's doubt because uh, you know it's our work, it's our job to bring together the work of of artists that's new um, that hasn't yet been embossed with meaning or coined into some kind of uh, dialogue, 
and uh, hasn't been designated with particular ideas. So this line of phenomenological thinking that I'm sketching, uh, I think, has an immediate kinship with the task of the curator in bringing together artists' works and trying to make some kind of collective meaning. And um, that's something that I hope at least is apparent. So, in any case, there is a text that's written. It's in English and it's in German. Uh, we have it in a brochure. If you're interested, you're welcome to, to read it. It's free. We're also printing a catalog. It should be available on the end of March. And that, uh, at that occasion, uh, we'll be doing a, uh, we'll be inviting Catherine Busch from University Berlin, uh, University Kunst of Berlin, to, to talk about phenomenology and contemporary art. She's a specialist, I am not. So I think, and that will be in German. So I hope that we, if you're interested, please come to that. Should we change the microphone or is it? Uh, Take your telephone. Telephone. Telephone's off, please. So to get to the heart of the matter, um, as I discussed uh, with almost everyone today, there, there are two kind of questions or statements from this text by Merleau-Ponty. <coughs> oh, let's get a text message. That I, I would ask each of the artists to reply to one by one. Um, and the first one, and this is, this is literally from the text Cezanne's Doubt, is now it's it's more of a statement, and I'm, I've asked each painter to respond to the statement in in accordance with their own work. And Chrissy, I thought we start with you actually. The the painter recaptures and converts into visible objects what would, without him or her, remain walled up in the separate life of each consciousness the vibration of appearances which is the cradle of things. This is the heart of the question now. Only one emotion is possible for the painter, the feeling of strangeness, and only one lyricism, that of the continual rebirth of existence. So the two parts, strangeness and lyricism, rebirth of existence. Percy? Yes. Mm. Hi. So these three things are my works that were chosen for this exhibition, and I think I will just try to make it very simple um, because I kind of respond to this element of the continuous rebirth of the image. Because I think that if you look at my works, which are constructed from little things, I I think they are sort of feats of engineering in a certain way. Um, I would say that uh, what I like, uh, even though I have my difficulties with the things, because I studied to become a painter and now I'm making these crazy constructions, so, you know, painters doubt. But, uh, but what I like is that uh, they are in a perpetual movement and, and I think in a perpetual rebirthing process, so that they never settle. And, uh, and, and I kind of like that because uh, they are in a way, um, um, uh, in a way sort of appearances of the mind and how it kind of tries to construct an image out of, um, out of phenomena. I mean, I, I'm very interested in this, uh, this idea of this uh, lyricism also because I did decide that yes, they will be paintings, they will be squares, and they will be just there. I mean, it would be kind of bombastically possible to make an installation with them and, and take them into a huge space. But I love the fact that, you know, the picture has the, the possibility to, to take you in. And if you really give yourself I, I say myself as the artist, if I give myself the opportunity to, to collaborate with these propositions for long enough, then my hope is that something will reveal itself 
that has some kind of uh, some kind of uh, depth that uh, that has this uh, this uh, phenomenological, if I may say so, aspiration that goes beyond the sort of immediate uh, satisfaction of of uh, of having the painterly surface in front of me. I would like the idea to be that one the mind becomes embroiled in the image and has a long time to travel in it. I mean, you know, if you were living with one, that this would be what it would kind of want to offer in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, engagement. And, and I think that, um, uh, that if, if, you, if you start looking at them and you, you have a little bit of time to spend with them, then maybe you, you, you find your mind to be kind of getting into this, not a tangle, I mean, it's not a chaos, but uh, you know, into these sort of propositions of all the possible things that can happen between the, the space and the color and, and, um, and so forth and so on. Now, I, I hope I answered a little bit the question. Um, I, I try to make it from my personal point of view in a very kind of broad way. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. So, Danielle, do you want me to repeat the question to you? Oh, uh, no. Oh, you remember it, don't you? Uh, Daniel yeah. Keating. I will, I will answer also a different way. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, uh, I, I love to describe also a little bit the process of working because I think the best answer to this, and I've been always uh, interested in a, in, a, in a space in painting and time, like two uh, topics. And uh, I, if I want to describe my work, so it's a little bit like a, a deconstruction and a reconstruction of something. It means that I have probably some personal image uh like an, like photography whatever or it used to be for example film image in my last work uh, earlier work and uh, i took this image and i somehow destroyed it in the way of uh, deconstruct it and uh, then i tried to rebuild a new space and a new uh, image but using this sign of the old image. It's a little bit complicated, but if you will have a look at my older work, so it's going to be clear for you. And uh, of course, I am trying to to get rid of uh, this uh, uh, this border between me and the object. So uh, that's probably that's why I decided to to work with the live models in my last work. So you can see behind me. And uh, I started to make this paper models, and uh, because uh, w what I can do is uh, that I can change the model in front of me, and I can uh, paint it in the same time. So it doesn't fit well, so I can change the model immediately, and change the colors and whatever. So the other thing is which is important for me that uh, the question of light and uh, probably uh, that uh, the mind, that the light is coming from you as the observers, if you have a look, so usually it's uh, going into the depth, in, into the darkness and the light is coming from your side. So it's like that you, if you uh, have a lamp and you go into the dark room and you will uh, you will make it lighter, so you will see something there for a moment. And uh, the, the other part of the question is that, well, uh, maybe that uh, why, the, the question why I do it, right? That's the question. Uh, if I feel like a stranger, and, and uh, why I need to do it. So this is a real hard question I, I cannot explain but probably it's the feeling of strangeness that you want to do reconstruction of the world which surround you uh, to make it more familiar to you and to other people okay thank you daniel so should i repeat the question are you ready 
Um, hi, um, my work's in the back of this pavilion there, so you can look at it later. Um, I think what I'm really responding to in this question is strangeness, really. Um, because, okay, I'm also going to talk about my process a little bit, because I guess it does make sense. Um, I draw a lot from digital imagery or digitalized imagery, so basically I go online and find images that I find interesting and then I try to draw out the elements that I find really interesting or weird and then I just start putting them on canvas. So there's no kind of mediation in between, I just start painting basically. Um, and then I kind of just layer them up and the canvas gets filled up with all these elements that kind of relate to each other in a little bit of a narrative context, I guess. But the narrative is only visible to me as the one who's working on those paintings, I guess. And I think the strangeness of the process is really important to me in a way because then while I'm working on those paintings, I always take a step back and the painting becomes a total stranger. And then that's where it gets interesting for me because then actually some things happened that I wasn't expecting. And then I start working from there and yeah, try to push it in a different way that I was expecting maybe. So that's kind of strangeness for me. Great, and so Anna Yeah, Amana, my works, there's five paintings there, and um, I think um, when I think about the strangeness, um, I, uh, I, I paint from photographs, and for me, it's, it's a, a, a trigger in a way. It's what makes me want to paint a certain image. It's, it's when I get a, a sort of feeling of strangeness. Um, so it could be a, a starting point for a group of paintings, uh, something that kind of just not sticking out in the image, um, and that I'm trying to hold on to when I'm painting. Um, and um, when it comes to uh, the um, continual rebirth of existence, I think that's in the brush marks and the the colour and that sort of that carries on living and to and in the meeting with the viewer it kind of keeps changing and um, kind of uncontrollably somehow. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Vivian and my work is a series of Teresa and Ecstasy on the back of this pavilion. And um, yeah, I think I also have to talk about strangeness. Is this is okay for you? Because in my work, um, I think it's all about getting into contact with something which is strange to me, but not in a way, not in a way like I feel strange about it. It's rather that I have the impression that um, we are strangers to each other. I don't know the other, and I really want to get to co in contact with the other. And in my paintings, I try to figure that out to get as close as possible to the other. And the painting is personification maybe of the other and this is the Teresa, the Teresa series so Teresa is maybe a symbol for the other um, another person which is Teresa in this case <laughs> and I really would like to get to know her and um, in Germany we got a really nice word and I didn't find an accurate um, <coughs> translation in English it's Antitz in Deutsch um, I think all of you are probably German so yeah I, I'm always saying in German like there's a lack of this antlitz, also es gibt so ein, ein, ein Verlust von diesem antlitz. Um, because I have the impression we only know the face as a mask. We, we get, we all have masks, we're all getting faces, but no longer the antlitz. And I'm missing this point of, yeah, looking into each other's eyes and see the other, feel the other. Uh, I have the impression that we are losing this contact. And in my work, I'm, I'm searching for this contact. And um, so anyway, it's, it's <laughs> the longing for rebirth of contact. <laughs> yeah. My name is Mairead O'Rourke. Um, my paintings are in that time machine <laughs> <in> there, <laughs> on this side of it. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to respond to it um, from my own um, personal uh, position where I trained as a photographer before I was a painter. And to me, um, discussions around uh, the sensory subject in relation to painting as opposed to other media is um, the bit that interests me because when you think about painting in relation to photography, the aspects of painting are quite obvious in terms of the senses. So there's touch and there is a sense of movement, the trace of, of the painter, but there's also the encounter with the painting as an object as opposed to the photograph. And for me, excuse me, what, what interests me about painting is that it seems to be a resistance to the reality consensus that lens-based media um, create. And um, the rebirth and the rebirth of existence, I think, is something really seductive to painters where they can reclaim uh, an aspect of living and represent it on their own terms. So when I think about that phrase, it, it does resonate. You're getting to take back control to a certain extent. And the strangeness is that you, you, you generally you will stand back, and I agree with the others, when you are confronted with that strangeness as it appears in front of you. Yeah, so my work is on the right side of the time machine and um, it is these small paintings and... Your name? My name is Khan. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so the strangeness, um, I guess, apart from this situation, it would be that I think in the, in the, like in the eyes of the people who is going to see my work, I think it might be a little bit they might be a little bit more strange than I wanted them to be because, well, they always end up to be a little bit more abstract than I want them to be. But I also realized that there's very little information um, sort of available for you about my paints, like because it's my fault really, because the paintings are so new that I haven't given them titles, for example, so there's no titles to them. And um, yeah, and I tried to, <laughs> like, I literally tried to give titles to them like one hour ago, but Seamus, Seamus was like, oh, that's not going to happen. Um, Mon Monday. Monday. Yeah, on Monday they're going to have titles. Um, but I think it would be um, fair, because, I, because there's some imagery in the paintings, and I think it would be fair to just tell a little bit about what it is, uh, or like where it comes from. I feel like this is also uh, phenomenology is where stuff comes from. Where, what is the origin of these things? And so on the red painting, there's this sort of, um, like, there's these objects, like silhouettes of objects that you would find on a still leaf, and there's this kind of, like a, a flask and a vase and a glass and these sort of objects that you would find in a, on the tabletop of a Morandi painting, for example. And, uh, but then they are kind of abstracted, they've sort of been, you know, swallowed by some kind of uh, cubist that's like digested them halfway and then it's sort of spit out again. And the next one from that is the draped figure, which is a, yeah, it's like a, an icon that's been used quite a lot uh, historically. And the last one is the head of a fawn, which is also, so all of these images are sort of pointing to some icons in art history that have been re like redistributed a lot and reproduced a lot um, to the extent that I think it's sort of it's almost authorless now or like it's kind of open source or what like it's kind of public domain I think um, I don't know how that ties in with the question but strangeness Strangeness. That's the strangeness. Great. <laughs> and okay. rebirth. And rebirth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could I have the, I'd like to read the second yes. passage. Thank you. Great. So great. Thank you, everyone. Um, 
Then the second passage that I'm going to read out again is from Cézanne's Doubt by Merleau-Ponty. And again, uh, everybody can respond to it in, in his or her own way, um, with their work in mind, of course. So Merleau-Ponty says, if the painter is to express the world, the arrangement of his or her colors must bear with them, within them this indivisible whole. And he's referring to what we we're discussing earlier around um, phenomenology and um, being. Or else his painting will only hint at things and will not give them the imperious unity, the presence, the unsurpassable plenitude, which is for us the definition of the real. So it's, it's a bit poetic, but effectively, I think that Rilo Ponty is saying that um, in order for the painter to really capture the world, there is this fundamental engagement in the moment, in the act, in the activity of painting with the substance of the universe, um, which he calls this imperious unity, this in unsurpassable plenitude. And in this case, uh, Merleau-Ponty was also very adept in, in psychology, and, uh, and he says, and this is for us the definition of the real, in, in terms of what is the real in a psychological sense, how we experience it. So I'm going to go back to you, Kersi, and start with you. Do you want me to hand you the piece of paper while you speak? or? Just remember, it's it's your own words. Yes, that's why I give you the paper <laughs> because it's uh, it's so uh, cosmic, and I think I would need the whole evening to articulate what I want to say to all these things. I I, I think it's um, I think that uh, it's 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 sort of very prickly, prickly stuff, and it's so kind of delightfully. Um, ambitious, you know, because you actually, it's actually kind of almost flattering to have the opportunity to, to articulate about something that's so far reaching. And I think that uh, I come back a little bit to this, to kind of round it off for myself personally to this theme of the strangeness, because I, I think that I started to look at these particular things that were hanging from my production on this wall. And I thought how often I, you know, I come from a very Protestant Lutheran background where, where the world is, uh, is kind of, a, the, this is kind of a very pragmatic world. And I'm often confronted with this idea of how far I can push something that is like a door that keeps opening and closing, that it's kind of inviting into this, into this world of this strangeness and of these I would say more like unanswered questions, that you never get this answer to it. I'm not really that interested in strangeness. I think I'm, I'm more grounded than that. So I kind of like this irritating quality in those things that's so pedestrian, you know, this architecture that kind of keeps showing itself to me and keeps showing itself to me in a kind of a, almost a boring way. And then, and then kind of I go back to it and I say, no, I would like you to reveal yourself in a more interesting way. And I think that um, uh, sometimes I think it's a little bit my pitfall and my weakness that I'm not able to relieve myself from this to, to be so utterly poetic and metaphysical. And, uh, and I'm sitting here sort of thinking I regret it that I, I maybe don't have that talent or that ability to to be so free. But uh, I'm not so old yet, so maybe I'll get to it if I keep struggling. But I still feel that I'm a little bit um, defiant, what's the word, you know, trapped. But, mm, but then I like this idea that there are sort of, sort of naughty, nasty traps so that's the state of uh, state of the union <laughs> at the moment, and I hope that I sort of answered that question in a very roundabout way. 
Um, I, I hope you're not too disappointed. But, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, this is something like when I hear this, I just kind of think, oh, I wish I could go there. I wish I could be so grand. But I, I can't. I'm, I'm, I kind of uh, think I'm a little bit... Well, I think then I'm confronted with my own limitations. But then if you are aspiring to be an artist, you're actually taking this outrageous notion that you have this unlimitation at your disposal. I mean, which is why a lot of people hate artists, because, you know, it's like, who do you think you are? You think you have this freedom. Well, you know, I think why I like this exhibition, and I'm, why I'm very happy to be a part of it, is that it's, it's kind of delivering this outrageous proposition as if we really had this, uh, this kind of um, power in our hands. And I must say, I find that the, that the kind of driving force in my own engagement with art. And I hope I live long enough so that I can, I can, at least when I die, I can think, okay, I made the effort, and maybe I can see a few pictures that got there. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, oh yeah, <clears throat> uh, I would sign. I would sign what you said now, and uh, don't know what to say more because my situation is a little bit similar, uh, very similar. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the question. Um, I didn't allow myself so much think about this kind of question. Because if I'm full of some metaphysical topics and I would like to reveal my paintings to be a little bit higher, so after that I do a lot of uh, bad paintings. And uh, on the other hand, if uh, I am just concentrated and I'm focused on something like very simple thing, like for example, if I say to myself, okay, be uh, focus on light or in simple object and if I am able to keep the concentration so then there are some moments I had that feeling that the painting is getting a little bit to another position I don't want to say meta metaphysical position but something happened in the process and it's a very nice feeling uh, and maybe that's the reason why I paint that time after time I get into this situation that I have that feeling that I am a little bit getting out of the material, out of this uh, process and it's becoming kind of harmony or whatever I would say. But it sounds crazy, like it's, uh, it's better don't describe it and it's, uh, I said to myself it's better to speak about the form and things I can speak about the topics, about this kind of thing. Because uh, most of the time I'm struggling and uh, I'm not catching this aim and this uh, metaphysical levels. But on the other hand, be just in the form and just in the matter without having this wish to go there. So it can be boring as well. So I think <laughs> we are a little bit between spaces. Thanks, Daniel. I mean, ever since you showed me this quote, like, I don't know, an hour ago, I've been thinking about how to respond to this, and I'm still unsure, because it's like this amazing compliment to painters and painting, like, condensing the whole of the universe onto this rectangular canvas. And, yeah, I mean, it would be amazing if it felt like that, but usually it doesn't really when you're working on a painting. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm still not really sure what to say about it really. So. And do you think, I mean, do you not think that this text, remember, is called Cezanne's Doubt? Mm -hmm. So Cezanne probably also would have responded in a similar way, maybe even rejected this. Probably, yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, the way I read this, uh, if I apply it to myself, um, I think it, I can relate to it as I, I make my paintings in one, 
go. So I don't have a break usually, uh, and I. It's, it's, it, I have to be present. I have to be um, focused, and I can. I can only. I mean, I, c I can't come back the next day and change things, or because then I'm no longer objective either. So, in that sense, I think. Um, a certain meditative uh, mood, I think, I, I'm in when I'm painting. And uh, that's kind of, yeah, it's, it's essential to, to my practice. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, I really like, um, yeah, I really like to see myself as kind of a, I don't know the English word, but maybe you can help me, Dienstleister. Dienstleister. Dienstleistung. Dienstleistung. Service, yeah, like service. service. Yeah. Like uh, me being a service <laughs> for, for the painting. Um, um, uh, this helps me to, to stand this pressure of doing this. <laughs> because I, I really like the moment when the painting becomes the subject and I can say, okay, I do it because I hear that you want me doing it. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, in a way, this is also a really, really important point um, in my work. Who is the object and who is the subject? We were talking when you were talking about this beforehand, because I really like that when the painting stays kind of a subject. That when it's possible for me to get a vis-a-vis -vis contact to the to the painting, and that the painting is telling something I didn't know, and um, that's also in my work. I think really. Um, yeah, it's really sensuousness. It's, it's, it has to be haptical because I want to have a painting you definitely want to touch. Um, I think then it works. And when I'm in the studio, this is a hard, hard way to get to this point. And it's always, and I mean, it's not almost, so, I don't know, English is difficult for me today. It's not always possible to have this situation. We are really fighting, the painting and me. <laughs> um, but when I see myself in service of it, I really like to do it, and I really like the fight as well. But yeah, sometimes it can be really depressive and boring. And yeah, it's also about focus, what you said. I think it's quite a lot of work to, every day, to be focused and to stay in my middle of my being. So I have to really sleep, do my sports, eat properly, to have the, the spirit very clear, to understand what's going on and what I have to do. Um, the bit that sticks out for me is the beginning bit, if the painter is to express the world. And it is ambitious in its premise, but I also think it's interesting in terms of the date. It's about 1940 something? 45. 45. Um, and he's talking about Cezanne. And actually, Cezanne had very um, ambitious plans and expectations for his work. And his intention was to express the world. Are certainly natural phenomena he was looking at and a means of expressing the sensory apprehension of nature through painting. And he was totally committed to this. And when I think about contemporary painting, I don't hear of any very many artists with grand ambitions to express the world or capture the world or anything on a par with what Cezanne hoped to achieve. So I, I don't want to capture or express the world, and I don't think very many painters have that ability. I think the point of making paintings is to have a tactile and physical um, relationship with their own negotiation of the world. And it's more of a modest claim than anything I can relate to here in this writing. <laughs> of the answers. Yeah, I I agree with you pretty much. I mean, I I I, uh, I don't think yeah I don't think of uh, yeah about the, you know capturing all of the world or broadening the world or to me it's almost like the like to me it's like it's almost like condensing all of this, all of these skeletons in the closet, like in the painting closet, you know, kind of 
it's almost like a, uh, I, I kind of get a kick out of trying to regress and trying to like provoke this kind of recession in painting where it almost just becomes kind of like a dead loop and having all of these old, you know, icons reappear again and it's kind of like pressing blood from a stone, you know, it's not, we're not really getting anywhere, it's not, it's not charity work, you know, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty tough, um, but yeah, what else was this in the credit? Yeah, I'm going to pass on the rest of the question. Okay. <laughs> Great. <coughs> Thank you, Carl. So, um, to wrap it up, I want to thank everybody here um, on the round table for your discussion. I think what for me is uh, a wonderful opportunity to do is to talk about some of the, these ideas and hear artists, uh, specifically in this context, painters speak about that. I think is something that um, is valuable and important for us. And of course, in, in each case, it's, it's a different answer. But we see some harmonies in, in people's approach to it. And uh, I also want to thank each of you personally for working with me. It's been a delight to work with you on the show. And thank you all for your off-maximum kites. Thank you. Thank you.